My name is Rich Imlay. I want to thank the folks at the Flower Show for letting me speak. Um, I've been in the lawn industry 37 years, 27 years as an active landscaper, and this is my 10th year as a consultant for Jonathan Green, a consultant and field rep. And I'm going to be talking to you about the new American lawn. It's a true concept on how to get a good lawn. One of my pet sayings is there's no such thing as four easy steps to a good lawn. And I'll go into that and tell you why when we go through this. The New American Lawn is a plan based on the use of both organic and traditional fertilizers on the lawns, a complete and responsible approach to lawn care, genetically superior lawn grasses, healthy biologically active soil. Take control of how you care for your lawn by using a more targeted approach. The end result will be an attractive, healthy lawn that won't be as subject to many of the lawn problems. The New American Lawn provides organic nourishment for the soil not just the grass. In turn, the soil provides the optimum environment for natural, thick, healthy lawns. Traditional lawn care methods that treat the symptoms deplete the soil of what the plants need. You know, anytime you put down a pesticide, you're going to get collateral damage. You're not just going to kill the bad guys. You're going to kill some good guys, too. So we want to minimize the use of it. In no way can you eradicate the use of it and get total success. But you can control the environment. Be smart. Let nature work in your favor and grow the new American lawn. Now, why do you put stuff down on your lawn? Is it your exercise program? You like walking around your lawn four or five times a year and that's what you do to stay healthy? Or do you want the best possible lawn that you can have? First thing is pH. If your pH is too high, your plants can't feed. If your pH is too low, your plants can't, can't feed. And it's a pretty fine line. If your pH is between 6 and 6.5, that's what I call maintenance range. The soil is consistently acidifying. So if your pH is 6 to 6.5, you apply an adjustment once a year. But if your pH is below 6, once a year is not enough. If your pH is 5, 5 to 6, you should be doing pH adjustments spring and fall. If your pH is below 5.5, you should keep adjusting every other month until you get it above 5.5. But if your pH is off, you're not going to succeed. A four-step program doesn't take this into consideration. pH means everything. And that is why it is an essential part of your lawn care program, making sure your pH is where you want it to be. Compaction. Misunderstood. There's a soil speaker named Chip Osborne. It cost 100 bucks to see him speak. Best 100 bucks ever, ever spent. And he kept it basic, and, and this is very interesting. Related to you, you can live without food for 15 days. You can live without water for five days. You can live without air for eight minutes. The soil, life in your soil is no different. You've got to have airflow. If your soil is compacted, you're going to fail. Compaction reduces root development and nutrient uptake, the biggest hurdle in all turf grow growing categories, restricts oxygen flow to roots and microbial population, promotes the effects of stress, heat, fungus, and weeds. And one thing that people don't understand, grass roots do not grow through soil. They grow in between soil particles. So if you're compacted, you can't root. And I've got a very scientific method to see if you're compacted or not. You take your finger, you stick it in. If you can't get it into the ground up to your middle knuckle, you need to core aerate. What turf plants need for optimum growth? Soil porosity for soil microbes to be active and facilitate efficient nutrient transfer, water movement, oxygen for microbes, space. In most cases, root mass development is most efficient in friable soil with a pH of 6.4 to 6. A clean source of water, sunlight, and suitable soil temperatures controlled release fertilizer, preferably with an organic product. Because again, your straight synthetics aren't really doing that much stimulation for soil biology. So you have to integrate organics in. If any of, or all of the previous mentioned requirements are not met, nutrient efficiency and turf health is compromised. Should I thatch or use a slit seeder when I seed? Maybe you should do both. If you have a significant thatch layer of more than one half inch, that's critical. That thatch layer will breed fungus, it'll suck up moisture, 
It'll stop insect control to, from getting to grubs. Um, so it's good to make sure that you don't have any more than a half inch of thatch. Overseeding, the best thing to do when you, slit seed, when you seed is to slit seed it, groove it in, get seed soil contact. That'll help you get moisture retention. And also remember, birds are site feeders. If you have grass seeds sitting on the surface, you got bird food. The future is now. Integrated pest management, IPM, that's the buzzword. You treat problems. You recognize problems. The first thing is identifying the problem. And it, it's not as easy as it looks. I'll tell you a quick story. I'm not gonna mention the town. But I had an athletic field, school athletic field up in North Jersey. And the guy's buying my fungicide and he calls me up and he's cursing me up. My fungicide stinks, yada, yada. He didn't say that nicely. But so I said, okay, fine, I'm going up there. Now I pull into the parking lot and I'm looking at it and I know what it is. So he comes out and he's growling at me. We're walking across the field. And I said, you know what, John? This is the first fungus I've ever seen that moved. He looks at me, it was chinch bug. He was treating chinch bug with a fungicide. It's not that hard. You go to our website, we can tell you ways to figure out how to know what it is. It's, it's relative, the one thing you look for is uh, fungus hops. Fungus goes spot, spot, spot. Insects are contiguous. Now eventually the fungus spots will coalesce if it goes too far. But just if you see hop, 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 you've probably got fungus. You can also see with fungus on the edge that's not dead yet, there's a lesion on the blade, a white lesion. Um, dollar spot and patch disease are the toughest ones in the summer. Don't discriminate. Just don't fertilize it. Because if you fertilize patch disease, you can kill your lawn. So that's just, I see it all the time. And you can always consult us, you can call us. Can you use organics to solve these problems? Well, yes and no. An organic approach can make your grass plant a more efficient machine. Getting the soil biology to do its work will help your plant more. In a straight synthetic program, you're not doing as much for the soil biology as you can. Blatantly stealing from Disney is my circle of life, which covers what you need. Number one, biologically active soil. Number two, food. Number three, stimulation. Something that is a microbial stimulate, stimulant to crank those little fellows up to do their job. And then number four, environment. Know your pH, know your airflow. A little love doesn't hurt either. When should I use pesticides? When they're winning. Now there is a new organic surface feeding insect control out that does a very nice job on surface feeders, not on grubs. Successful crabgrass and broadleaf weed control. I'm going to do a whole other presentation on weeds when I get done with this one. But identify whether it's an annual or a perennial. Uh, a broadleaf weed is, the broader the leaf on a weed, the easier it's going to kill as long as it's not a viner. But the best control for weeds is a dense, thick lawn. Proper timing is a key. Throwing down your pre-emergent in March is, in effect, being an ecological terrorist. It's not gonna do you any good. Again, get out of the classic four-step thinking. Get out of that forsythia blooming thing and wait to put your pre-emergent down. When the crabgrass population is diminished, you're gonna get less down the road. But there are billions of crabgrass seeds in every lawn. And you can't kill the seed, you have to kill the plant. It has to throw a root or have a leaf surface to kill. And as I was saying before, if you've got a crabgrass problem, Historically, you shouldn't be doing step one, two, three, four. You should be doing step one, one, three, four. You split up your pre-emergent. Every respectable landscaper puts down two applications of crabgrass control because crabgrass germinates constantly through August. The best crabgrass in the world, control in the world, given ideal conditions, will give you eight weeks. Well, if you put it down in May, eight weeks are gone in July. You got another month for crabgrass. So split up your crabgrass control. If you've got a crabgrass problem, do it once in early May and do it again in early to mid-June. Again, best control for crabgrass and weeds is thick turf. 
Broadleaf weed control is a selective chemical control, only works on actively growing weeds. We're going to talk about a weed later we're going to have a little bit of a problem with. What happens is the weed has to eat the weed control for it to kill it. So throwing down weed control on your chickweed in March is irresponsible. It's not going to answer your problem. Can you combine both synthetic and organic products on the same lawn? Absolutely. In fact, I strongly recommend it. Because again, especially with New Jersey's new laws, you've got to get something to get the phosphorus out of the soil. The phosphorus is in your soil. Jersey's banned phosphorus except for seeding. But the, it's bound up. Microbial degradation will bring that phosphorus out and make it useful. But you've got to crank the microbes up to get them to degrade. Synthetic products alone will not get most benefits from your soil biology. There are billions of microbes in the soil. You know, it, it's really sexy to sell mycorrhizae. Well, unless your soil is really messed up, you've got it already. The key is stimulating it, getting it to work for you. Organic products alone will not avert a pest disaster. It's a fact. It's not going to give you grub control. There are new advances in surface feeding, insect control, and tick control. Um, it's not going to selectively, effectively control weeds unless you've got a really broad leaf weed like a dandelion. Uh, your organic selectives are not going to work. Combine them for the best of all lawns. Organics work better in warmer temperatures. Organics feed the soil, which feeds the plant. So the synthetics you do in cooler temperatures. New Jersey fertilizer law, you, you can go to the website I'm going to show you, but basically uh, you can't fertilize your lawn after November 15th. You can't fertilize your lawn before March 1st. Um, there's nitrogen limits. This is all can be found on the website, which is there. And I'll leave that slide up for a couple of seconds. While I entertain questions, we have a question. Where's my mic, man? Okay. Uh, home, I thought homeowners could apply, uh, that commercial couldn't apply fertilizer, and homeowners, it doesn't really apply. No, homeowners are, are un under this law, and also it's... Also with the phosphorus? Yes, uh -huh. and it's being enforced by the municipalities because the DEP doesn't have enough people. So you can get a ticket for using phosphorus on your lawn without putting seed down. You can get a ticket for fertilizing outside of the window dates. So, and, and there's reasons for the law. I'm not gonna get political here, but it's the law. So, any Home other? Home Depot sells the products oh. outside of those dates. Oh, you can sell it. My dealers are selling it left and right, uh, but you can't use it. It comes down to you. It doesn't come down to the dealer. Now we have they can a, also use liquid. They have liquid lime or liquid phosphorus. Well, lime isn't a fertilizer. I know. Lime's they, okay. They it's just, but I don't care what the phosphorus is. You can't use it unless you're putting it down uh -huh. seed. You mentioned the importance of um, slit seeding. Yes. And how can you do that without actually renting a slit seeder? A heavy rake. A heavy rake. Yeah, I recommend the people, tines. whenever they seed, rough it into the soil. Don't bury it. If it goes more than a half inch down, it's not going to germinate because UV is not going to get to it. But just rough it in with a hand rake. Just so, number one, you're going to get seed soil contact so you get better moisture retention. And number two, the birds can't see it. Right, so it's not there. And then one other question about knowing if you have thatch. If you have a, a dethatching rake, should you use that religiously before? If you, you do you it every year, it? if you power rake the lawn every year, it will deter thatch. Once you get a critical layer of thatch, you have to mechanically remove it. You, you, your, your hands will bleed, your arms will fall off, it, it just, you can't do it. So you just have to see if you're not critical. Uh, during the month of uh, June and July, I have patches of, uh, so, uh, of grass getting yellow, uh -huh. about one and a half square feet. So I asked the guy who fertilized my lawn, whether it's the fr from fertilization or whatever, they don't know. They said, we don't know. We have to test the ground. Uh, how do you test the pH, uh, the, the, the ground? Well, I don't think that's a pH problem. I think it's one of three things. It's, if it's going bump, bump, bump. Yes, that's how it is. It's fungus. If it's contiguous, it's chinch bug. Or it's burn. Either urine burn or fertilizer burn. On the hill, there isn't. When it is flat, when the ground is flat, I have it there. 
But when the, uh, it goes like a slope, a hill, uh -huh. it's clear. It does Because that's where all your water's going. Because of water. The water's going down the hill. You yeah. see, how grass stays ahead of maladies is growth rate exceeds spread of disease. If you've got water in the summer, it's going to grow better. So it's going to grow stuff out better than a flat area where the water goes away quickly. Without seeing it, I'm not going to definitively say this is your problem. But I will say um, it's really easy. You go to the edge of it. you got the brown spot. Then you go to the edge of it and you look at the grass blades. And if there's little lesions on the grass blades, that's fungus. You can do a test yourself for chinch bug. You take a coffee can, you cut the top and the bottom out of it. You take it and put it at the edge of the damaged area, scrunch it around and put water in. If a bunch of little black things come floating up, you got drowning chinch bugs. So you can identify this stuff. You get a, a can? Cut the top and the bottom out, out of it, scrunch it into the ground, put water in it, and see if anything comes floating up. If something comes floating up, that's bugs. You got a bug problem. If you've got lesions on the perimeter of the damaged area, that's fungus problem. Well, this stays about uh, two weeks, uh, three weeks sometimes, then it disappears, you know. Well, then I see new grass coming out, you know. It's probably, well, then it's not insect. It's probably fungal and it's growing out. How do you get rid of fungus? You don't. Once a lawn has a fungus, it will always have a fungus. You're not going to eradicate it. A fungus control doesn't really kill the fungus, it arrests the fungus, allowing your grass time to grow it out. If you have a historic fungus in your lawn, the best thing you can do is put down fungicide on a preventative basis June 10th, July 10th, and August 10th, because those are your bad months. OK? Every month. Every month. Every month, yeah. Anything else? Questions? When you said you put, you, you put your finger in the soil, it has to go this, this much. It's impossible. That means you need to be aerated. The soil is hard. That, it's, yeah, but if you, you can't get your finger in. Under the, under the grass? Under the grass. If you can't get your finger in, you go because, you're not getting airflow. And that's a problem. Some lawns need to be core aerated every year. I, I haven't been to your house, so I don't know. Well, I, I, I aerate it with that machine. I show it over there. Does it pull the cords out? Or it, it just pulls, pokes holes? No, it pulls the dead grass. Oh, you're in. thatching. Yeah. That's thatching. That's different. Yeah. Thatching, it's here. Yeah. If, you, if you can't get to, uh, to here without feeling dirt, you got a thatch problem. Aeration, it's here. I have a tractor. Uh, I can uh, get something there on the tractor. You can get a power rake on your tractor and do it every year. Yeah. Oh, yeah? You just drag it by. It's very good to power rake your lawn in the fall. Don't do it in the spring. Don't aerate in the spring unless you have to, because you want weeds. Thatcher, disturb the soil in the spring. You're going to get weeds like crazy. It when you do that? Fall. Or in the fall. September. OK. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Anything else? OK, we're going to go to section two. Oh, no, this is important. I just stuck this in. This is going to be a problem this year. If you stop by my table, we got a handout for it. Snow mold. If you get more than 30 consecutive days of snow cover, snow is an insulator. It creates heat underneath. And this fungus called snow mold will grow. And it looks that bad. It's white and goopy. Um, you rake it out lightly as soon as you can this spring. Apply a significant nitrogen fertilizer to it in the spring, because what you're doing is you're growing it out. And in the future, to prevent snow mold or to deter snow mold, you do very low nitrogen in the fall. Throwing down 30 something percent nitrogen in November is writing an invitation to the snow mold party. You want to keep that end application low in the fall. Core rate, if you're compacted, you're more likely to get snow mold. And cut your lawn short on the last cut, an inch and a half. You don't want to cut the lawn below three inches any other time, but last cut of the year, go down to an inch and a half so the grass, the plants don't crack, freeze, crack, and bleed. Okay? Now we're going to be going to weed control. Something old, something new, gives you headaches, makes homeowners blue. Weeds are, for the most part, natives of this area. Quality turf grass is not. Weeds will naturally thrive. Grass needs help. The best weed control, again, is thick, healthy grass, biologically healthy soil with good surface air movement. 
We've seen this already, but I'll show it to you again because pH does mean everything. pH means everything, why? Acidic soils will result in calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus deficiency. May increase availability of aluminum manganese to levels that may be toxic. Will lessen soil microorganisms' ability to break down fertilizers and thatch. Creates conditions that favor the growth of weeds. Lessen the effectiveness of organic fertilizers. Reduce the populations of microorganisms that suppress some pathogenic funguses. And reduce the effectiveness of some herbicides and insecticides. pH means everything. Compacted soil. The soil contains all those things that work together as an orchestra to make beautiful plant music. But when even one of these instruments is out of balance, the entire band is disrupted. Air is at the top, where it should be. Compaction is the most dangerous disruption. We've been through that already. How to address compaction? OK. Right before you core aerate, mow the lawn a third shorter than normal, water deeply the day before aerating, core aerate. Pull the plugs out. Tine aerating is just compacting more. Core aerating is allowing air to go down. Top dress with organic matter and return to normal watering and cutting practices. Make your turf as happy as your weeds. Now that we've addressed optimizing soil conditions for your grass, it's time to attack. Practically any, a weed is any plant that you don't want growing in your turf. For sake of this talk, we're going to include a couple of noxious grass types. Fighting weeds. Choose the herbicide that is most effective against specific malady. Now most of the spray weed controls you buy out there are three-way, MCCP, 2,4-D, and dicamba. They'll do good on real broadleaf stuff like plantain, dandelion, but look at the weed control you're buying. Number one, you're going to be more ecologically responsible because you'll have to use it less if you use the stuff that works. There is a fourth component to weed control called, called carfentrazone that does a very good job. It will take out weeds that your classic three-way won't. Wild violets, thistle, ground ivy. And instead of having to spray your clover four times to get rid of it, you got a good shot at taking it out in one shot. But you need to have something that contains the carfentrazone. Some new weed challenges have arisen. And I'm going to go over four tough guys, one which you will see very soon. Bittercress. It's often misidentified as chickweed, but it grows a stalk with a white flower on top. It's a, I'm not, I can't say what it is, but it's one of those. Uh, it's an annual plant. It's earliest to sprout from seed, prefers cool, moist soils. Well, we're going to have moist soils with all the snow melts. Hard to kill because it grows in cold weather, which limits the effectiveness of, of herbicides. Again, the weed control has to eat the weed control. The weed control has to be eaten to work. For some reason, bittergrass will grow in really cold weather. It makes it very difficult. Ester formulas are not really available to retail anymore. It's an oil-based formula that envelops the plant and forces it to use the weed control. It's going to work on bittercress. Um, you can wait to spray this into April, but you've got to watch out because when it gets hot, the bittercress just dies. And if it's dead, you can't kill it, and it's already dropped seeds. So you got to get it before it drops the seed. Oh boy, Japanese stilt grass, the plague. It was introduced in the United States as a result of its use as packing material for porcelain. It will just take everything over. It looks like prostate bamboo. It can grow into a Japanese stilt grass bush if you don't cut it. It spreads seeds by ve and vegetative spread by rooting at the joints. You see there's a bunch of little joints in that vine. A new one will grow out of there. A new plant can emerge from each node. A single plant can produce up to 1,000 seeds that remain viable for three years. Seeds are spread by water, foot, and air traffic. Control. Start pulling it. I very rarely say pull weeds, because generally when you pull one, you get three. But you really don't have a selective that's going to take this out. Um, you have to use Roundup on it to really kill it, and you may have to use multiple applications of Roundup, and I know you don't like Roundup. Um, research has shown, but I'm not convinced of this, that split applying pre-emergent late April, early June, along with spot treating flares with Roundup, will provide encouraging results. Okay, let's see. But it's a plague. 
This is a new one. It was around for a while, but not real a lot of it. But I kind of credit Sandy for this. I think she brought us in a lot of seeds. Dallas grass. It originated in Uruguay and Argentina. It's a coarse textured perennial. Smothers turf grass, loves nitrogen, grows twice as fast as turf grass. It's often misidentified as crabgrass. I had some landscapers lose up accounts last year because they were misidentifying Dallas grass as crabgrass, treating it as crabgrass, and guess what? It spread like crazy. And what's very interesting and dangerous is the seed heads of Dallas grass are susceptible to an ergot fungus which is toxic to livestock if ingested. So if you're a farmer, you got livestock, you want to make sure you don't have Dallas grass in your field. Control, difficult to permanently remove manually. You can't really pull it out. Roundup is it. it. May take multiple applications, but you've got to get it, and you've got to get it before it goes to seed head. Because Roundup doesn't work on seed heads. Roundup work on plants. If the plant goes to seed head, well, you've lost that battle till next year. Can be deterred by pre-emergence, toxic to crabgrass, but not totally controlled. And our friend Nutsedge. Well, it's a consistently increasing problem in turf. It's not a grass, but a true sedge. It's got a triangular stem. Uh, leaves thicker and stiffer than crabgrass. Produces tubers, nuts, which are nuts that form as deep as 8 to 14 inches below the surface. You going to dig a foot down to get that nut out? No, I don't think so. Perennial tubers survive up to three years, but are reproductive. One nut can put out up to 100 tubers, which will make 100 nuts, which will make 100 nut sedge plants, which will on and on and on and on. Um, it, and the bad thing is, it doesn't emerge at the same time. It may skip a couple of years. Treatment. There is no effective pre-emergent, several, really only one effective post-emergent. The best results from that come from an active ingredient of, of halicifuron. You know, write that down. That's what's going to get your nut sedge. Um, yes, that's, I'm not allowed to mention trade names here. Dominic will have me, you know, lasered. Um, can only be controlled by spraying the leaf. If there isn't a leaf, you're not going to stop it. It may flare up a couple years after you think it's gone, and it's going to take several years for total control. Persistent is the key. I'll tell you a quick story on that one. When I was a landscaper, they were always coming out with something for nuts hedge. And thankfully, I only tried stuff on myself or my friend's lawn. Some of them weren't friends after this, and it would kill everything but the nut sedge. Then in the late 80s, Manage Halicifurin came out. And I had a bad nut sedge problem in my own lawn. And it took me four years. I, I went from lots of nut sedge to some nut sedge to less nut sedge. Fourth year, no nut sedge. Two years later, bang, here it comes again. Nuts will stay dormant for a long time. But you've got it pretty much under control. Instead of having to go out and spray every 10 days, you go out, OK, I'll, I got four plants. I'll take care of that. The best way for a homeowner, a lawn service isn't going to do this because they can't afford to do this, um, to treat nut sedge is you get your halosifer and you have to mix it in this one gallon spray tank. And every 10 days from June 10th until August 15th, walk your lawn and zap the nut sedge plants that have come up. And again, it may take several years, but that's the way to do it. Don't bother spraying it after August 15th because at that point, the plant has done what's called hardened off, and you're just going to burn the leaf off. And you can leave it in a spray tank, just agitate it. Yeah. Agitate it. And don't keep it over the winter, of course. But, but you know, one oh, packet yeah. makes a gallon. Yeah. You've got to have a lot of nut sedge to use a gallon. And there is a beautiful lawn that I all expect you to have after doing everything I tell you to do. And that's the end. Do we have any questions? is, thank you, um, I think they call it false strawberry. Um, it's got a runner on it. It's not an edible strawberry. Um, uh-huh. Sink foil. Part, uh, I guess you could call it that. Yeah, sink foil is a technical name, yeah. And so what do you recommend as far as the most effective weed control? The four-way. The four-way. Yeah, with the carfenter zone. You have to have the carfenter zone. Okay, and that's spray. It's a spray. Application. Yeah, spray. Okay. And one time, or you would? As often as you need. Until it goes. You know, some weeds you may have to. I would not reapply it for hot. 17 to 21 days. Okay. And, and when it gets hot, yeah. you're getting risky. 
it comes down to how bad you want to get rid of the weed. You want to kill some grass to get rid of the weed? Well, maybe you have to, so okay, fine. And how early can you start spraying it? Soil temperature is 60 degrees and above. Okay. And there's a marvelous New Jersey website that if you look under New Jersey soil temperatures, it gives you daily readings by county. Oh, wow. Okay. They probably have one down by Philly, too. That's great. Yeah. So. Good. Anything else I can answer for you folks? This place which you said it's on Gaffold Road. In what town? Which goes Gaffold Road? Ridgewood. Ridgewood. Oh, Ridgewood. Yeah. Goes yeah. Middle. No, no, don't go down to Patterson. No, no, no. In it's Ridgewood. in Ridgewood. Okay, very it's good. north of 208. Okay. Okay. Creeping bent grass. That's a toughie. Multiple applications of Roundup. Or pull it out. Yeah, but you pull it out, you're going to spread it. There's a new thing. There's a new thing that'll allow Kentucky bluegrass to grow. Yeah, tenacity. Tenacity. Does that work? No. In my opinion, no. It may work for some people, but from what I've seen, no. Bent grass is tough. Again, you're not supposed to have it growing in your lawn. The, it, and, and the thing is, I'll tell you one more thing that'll be important in that. When you buy seed, 4.999% of that seed can be the dreaded other. That other very well could be bent grass. It could be Poe Trivialis. It could be many awful things. So make sure that when you buy your seed, the other is really low. You know, weed seed, I don't care. You kill weeds. But it's nice to have no weed seed. But other is bad. Anything else I can answer? Do you have a type of seed that you recommend? Yeah. Type of seed that you recommend that basically, I know, um, you can say turf type fall tall fescue something versus a Kentucky bluegrass? Or well, I recommend species diversity. You see, one of the high points of my year is I go to Rutgers Field Day every year where they walk you around 24 acres of test plots on the hottest day of the year. It's heaven. And this year, the ryegrass, straight ryegrass plots, didn't have anything to look at. Uh, Pythium blight wiped it all out. The t straight tall fescue plots had patch disease pressure. But if you have a mix and right now, I've been doing this 37 years. If I'm standing up, I cannot tell the difference between a new blue, uh, nice bluegrass plant, tall fescue plant, or ryegrass plant. They blend. So a but mixture, 20% diversity. You could do 80 tall, 10 rye, 10 blue. You, to me, that's a little heavy on blue. You can do 75 tall, 20 rye, 5 blue. You can do 50 tall, 45 rye, 5 blue. But you want species diversity to reduce fungus pressure. But you. You can't go wrong with the nicer ones. And I'm not a big bluegrass fan. You know, number one, 5% blue, that's hardly any bluegrass. No, 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 no. That is based on, on uh, weight. The bluegrass seed is very small. There are six bluegrass seeds for every rye and tall fescue seed. So that 5% blue is really 20 something percent blue. Um, so I, I would like to see a mixture of all three. Okay. Anything else I can answer? Your company come out to look at specific lawns sometimes or not really? I do. You do? Yeah. It's kind of sad. It's what I do for fun. And I don't charge. You got my card. Anything else I can answer for you folks? How do you test the pH? You'd be able to test it? Well, uh, Goffelbrook has what's called a Kelway meter. And those liquid pH things I don't like because if it's pH is 6, it's green. If the pH is 5.5, 5, it's green. What's the difference between 6 and 5.5? 5. Whereas a Kelway meter, you stick it in the ground, you wait a minute, and it will give you uh, to the tenth of a point accuracy. So take a Chinese food quart of soil into Goffelbrook, and they'll test it for you. And then I'm doing a seminar up there later this year where I'll be testing. Do they, have the, do they sell the machine? The... No, you don't, a Kelway meter costs 160 bucks. They'll test it for you. Do you like soil test kits from Rutgers? Or? I decline to answer that. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to say When you going to be over there? Stop by my table, and I'll give you the date. I'm in aisle 400. Um, now, your rep in Haddonfield is Steve Leyland. He is excellent. Okay. If you stop by my table, I'll give you his phone number. I will. I will. Good. Thank you. Opie. Thank you. 
fungus? You can make, well, you can kind of deter it. If you, number one, I don't know what fungus you're getting in the summer. Because back in the old days, we used to treat fungus in the summer by hitting it with 4600, hammer it with nitrogen. But that's before patch disease became a major player up here. And then one year, I killed about nine of my lawns by hitting patch disease with, with uh, nitrogen. And patch disease is spread by nitrogen. So my sa the safest way, I would say, for you to try to deter it is number one, don't do a heavy nitrogen fertilizer after the end of May. Number two, make sure you're not watering after four o'clock in the afternoon or before 3 a.m. in the morning because you should never water your lawn after 4 p.m. or before 3 a.m. in the summer because you're going to create a greenhouse effect which is going to spread fungus. But you got to realize, did you ever see postmen choose patterns of fungus? You'll see it with snow mold. The snow melt and you'll see like footprints of snow mold. The postman is carrying it from other lawns to your lawn. So it can come, it can come on your feet. I had a lawnmower guy, oh my gosh, this guy, he messed with me. He didn't listen to a word I said. And he calls me up and he says, gotta help me, yeah. he was on Staten Island. And I go out there, he's got four lawns in a row. The first one is gone, Pythium blight. The second one is two thirds gone, Pythium blight. The third one is pretty bad Pythium blight and the fourth one's just starting. I turn and I said, which lawn do you mow first? The one that was gone, he's carrying it on his lawnmower. You can mow the afflicted area last and then clean your mower blades. You mow where you don't have fungus first, mow the afflicted area last and then clean your mower blades. Okay, well the fungus is basically on my grapevines. Well grapevines I don't do. And there's certain areas where the plants are and that's yeah. where You, you the should talk to the Rutgers people certain... about that because I'm just a grass guy. Okay. Well fungus is fungus. Hey, fungus is fungus. Yeah, it could be fertilization practices, but I would talk to the Rutgers co-op people about that. Okay. The extension service, I'm sorry. When there is dew in, at night, in the morning I get up and uh, I see the, I walk in the grass, you know, I see white, something white on the Spider webs. Of it's mycelium. That's how fungus spreads. What is that? Mycelium. Oh, mycelium. That is how fungus spreads. If you get up in the morning and see spider webs on your lawn, don't put down an insecticide. It's not spider webs. It's how fungus travels from plant to Just plant. Just I put my foot, I do it like that. And, and it goes away. Well, yeah. you, you won't see it at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning because it burns off. Oh. It's early in the morning. That's how you can tell you have early onset of fungus is you have mycelia. Oh, I see. Okay? Do you have to take care of it by some way? Or? Well, no, unless the fungus, listen, there's fungus in any lawn. The question comes down to are you winning or are you losing? If you're losing, you got to treat it. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a proponent of indiscriminately using fungicides. You know, if you want to prevent it in your lawn, you have to do it on a preventative basis. Well, this company through green, you know, since I got to, uh, with them, uh -huh. I got better lawn, you know. Okay. No matter what I did, I could not gain. Okay. It. Well, again, I'm a very because strong... I have about half an acre, you know. I'm a very strong proponent of don't fix what ain't broke. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, thank, thank you anything else I can answer for any of you? We're good? You've been very quiet back there. Nothing? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.